Today is my final word on Dragon's Dogma 2. From now on, uh, after the publication of this video, you can direct all of your questions to Gorzak. Enjoy! As I understand it, my spirited opinions on Dragon's Dogma 2 caused a bit of a shitstorm this past week. No, 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 I better not say that. Sorry, sorry, that's the wrong choice of word. Correct. That's the word I should use. My correct opinions caused a bit of a shitstorm. Also, I use the term as I understand it because I spent most of the week far the fuck away from the internet. Often these days, I don't know I'm being attacked online until a friend messages me asking if I'm okay because it looks like I've had a rough week. I'm okay, Casey Love, I'm doing fine. Of late, I found myself worrying about online shitstorms less and less, partly because social media itself is losing any hold it had on me for a variety of reasons, not exclusively related to, but regularly adjacent to, Elon Musk. Prick! I mean, I found out I was the target of one harassment campaign directed at me a month after it was over. So little of this matters. I mean, I'm 40 now. I'm staring unblinking down the barrel of mortality and I have pelvic floor exercises to do before it's entirely too late. I can't be fretting about how many tweets are telling me I'll never be a woman. Today's video is multi-pronged, like a trident, only one made out of shit. It's half clawed out from the pieces of discourse that did inevitably crowbar their way into my life despite my best efforts, and the rest of it's deeper examination into the problem at the core of all of this, Dragon's Dogma 2's philosophy of inconvenience. What do you presume to gain by this, Arisen? As discussed in last week's video and my recent review of the game, Dragon's Dogma 2 is terrible. I will very, 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 very quickly cliff note my issues here since the full dressing down has been previously published. The original was a throwback and not in all the right ways 12 years ago. The sequel is a Xerox that doubles down on its worst elements, which are basically the worst elements of Monster Hunter and Shenmue, but worse. To release an identical game to one that felt dated in 2012 is one thing, but Capcom chose to sell quality of life microtransactions as conveniences in a game that's antithetical to the very notion of convenience. Which just goes to show, they know they made a bad game. They're charging you to skip it. Deliberately vague objectives, quests designed to be accidentally broken without players knowing, a day-night system where you have to literally guess when things happen, and fucking endless, endless backtracking. We'll be discussing fast travel in detail in another section, but for now let's just say it's so useless, backwards and deliberately withholding that it might as well not be there. You know, a bit like Todd Howard in a developer's studio, if the rumours are to be believed. This means most of the game, and I do mean most of it, is spent hoofing it backwards and forwards along a noodly maze of long linear paths that spawn the same enemies and traps every time. With towns spread so far apart it can take upwards of 20 minutes to get from A to B, one cannot emphasise enough how boring this game is. So of course when I criticised this, people defended it, and as usual when this happens I had a lot of fun not believing them. So it was that I logged onto Twitter for the first time in a while to post show me someone claiming to love their 20th backtrack through the same long path with the exact same enemy placement and I'll show you a fucking liar. For some reason this was controversial. Apparently there really are people, hundreds in fact, who have just as much fun slowly walking back and forth along the same undynamic road the 20th time as they did the first time. And sorry but if you are claiming that, I don't believe you. I simply don't believe you. I know how that makes me sound. I know that is me dismissing the opinions that people say they have, but I don't believe you. Last I checked, grinding was generally considered a bad thing, and I'd love to hear how functionally there is a difference between level grinding by fighting the same battles over and over for incremental gains and what Dragon's Dogma does. In fact, I can tell you the difference. What Dragon's Dogma does is worse than level grinding. At least level grinding has an abject purpose with a payoff at the end of it. You know, if you grind to beat a specific boss, you've got a goal in mind, so you can at least feel it was worth it in some way. Dragon's Dogma makes you do the same thing over and over again for no reason. There's no payoff. 
there's just arriving at the same city you've been to ten times already. Give me level grinding over geo grinding any day of the week. Even if you don't get bored and run past all the goblin fights along the way, they'll stop being a worthwhile source of XP long before the game stops making you encounter them. Now, I did happen upon a couple of tweets that had some interesting responses to uh, what I've been saying. Uh, one of them said that everything I've said about the backtracking in Dragon's Dogma 2 can be applied to a Metroidvania, but I'm just describing a Metroidvania. First of all, no. Second of all, uh, when you backtrack in a Metroidvania, uh, it's almost always because you've got a new item that lets you get to an inaccessible area. You're backtracking to go somewhere new, uh, which is not necessarily the case for most of Dragon's Dogma 2. Also, if it took 20 minutes to get anywhere in a Metroidvania and they made you walk manually back and forth between two points, that would be a really shit Metroidvania. And uh, just to cap all that off, I feel it would be remiss of me not to say that uh, Symphony of the Night, uh, which was released in the 90s, had a better fast travel system than Dragon's Dogma. Also, someone compared it to the Spencer Mansion um, from Resident Evil, and there's a litany of reasons why that's wrong, and I feel like going through all of them insults both me and yourself, but uh, let me just say that there's a world of difference between exploring a house and exploring a world. Clearly this is the weapon durability thing all over again, and I still stick to that claim I made, that nobody has been in the middle of a boss fight and genuinely thought they'd have a lot more fun if their sword broke. Similarly, I am gonna stick to my claim that nobody loves the idea of walking along the same static road 20 times just because Capcom said fuck you to the last several decades of game design. Nobody playing a video game has ever walked to a location, forgot to bring something important, fast travelled back to town, fast travelled back again, and then thought it would have been so much more fun if I had to do all that manually. No, nobody has ever said that, and nobody will ever say it in future for any reason other than to try and snivellingly prove me wrong. Case closed. Wager. Launching with 21 in-app purchases that range from coercive to borderline fraudulently useless, Dragon's Dogma 2 is more than a badly designed relic, but a predatory scam that weaponizes the worst of its design in an attempt to manipulate money from susceptible and vulnerable players. And yes, that includes fast travel, which they have totally monetized, no matter how many Capcom simps crawl out of the woodwork to do a corporation's dirty work and run their PR for them free of charge like a fucking mark. Last week's video sparked something of a debate over whether or not fast travel was monetized as I asserted, with some arguing that it totally isn't, and others being totally correct by saying it totally is. Admittedly, the confusion did come directly from myself, as despite my laborious and personally satisfying description of Dragon's Dogma's spiteful fast travel system, I did a shit job explaining exactly how Capcom was leveraging it for financial gain. Specifically, while describing the items and consumables arbitrarily needed for fast travel, I made it sound like Capcom is selling fairy stones, the stupidly rare currency that costs fucking 10,000 gold to buy in the game. To make it clear, what Capcom is selling among its suite of predatory microtransactions is a port stone, a manual fast travel point that's so hard to get in game that you could play for 30 hours and never see one. Now, I've seen a few responses to last week's video delightedly attacking me for being wrong because I said fast travel had microtransactions, I didn't, and that therefore fast travel isn't monetized like I claimed it was. Haha, <laughs> yeah, about that. Not only is fast travel monetized, but what Capcom's doing is actually worse than I'd made them originally sound. So just before I explain all that, I'd like to thank the Capcom fans who quote unquote corrected me last week and pointed out, however inadvertently, that Dragon's Dogma is even more of a maliciously manipulative piece of shit. I put it perfectly in my review, so I will read what I wrote about fast travel from that because, well, I'm a phenomenal writer so it's worth doing. Fast travel is so skeletal in its implementation that for most of the game it's essentially non-existent. In order to fast travel anywhere you need to find an incredibly rare consumable or buy it for half as much as an entire house costs. Even worse, you can only travel to designated port crystals and their placement. So cotton mouthy. I can't even imagine how that's gonna have nothing to do with 
Right? But it's really annoying because, like, I'm in a race to finish these before the bag of gummies I down kicks in. <laughs> to say most towns and cities can't be travelled to is to undersell the artificial pork crystal drought. There are major quest hubs that require constant revisiting and they don't have fast travel points. It is lunacy. Of course, this game has a characteristically snide solution, a collectible item that lets you place your own warp point. A collectible that, of course, is even rarer than the consumables needed to use them, and if you ever want to move one of the tiny few you might be able to grab, you must manually retrieve it and then walk it to your new goal. Oh, and looking for port crystals in game is like trying to get into the fucking Bilderberg meeting. It's a fast travel system that requires two separate rare resources to use and is large unworkable. But rather than make it even the slightest bit better, Capcom chose instead to monetize it. You may very well be tempted to make a deal with that devil if you walk halfway around the world and find your destination has no other way to return when you leave. Just a disgusting bit of leverage on the part of the publisher. And that's why it's even worse. It is so coercive. That is such a fuck you. Yeah, nothing like a game painting you into a corner to have a good time. Somehow that's even more hostile than just plain microtransactions, which don't worry, the game's got them too. Look, when people defend Dragon's Dogma by claiming its fast travel system isn't monetized, they're helping Capcom get away with hiding its monetization behind extra steps. From a calculatedly technical standpoint, Capcom is not selling the ability to fast travel. No, it's just selling a destination. It takes a lot of intellectual dishonesty to claim that a game isn't monetizing fast travel when a crucial element of it is literally monetized. It requires a zealous omission of context to hand wave the sheer extremity of artificial scarcity we're talking about when it comes to port stones or port crystals or whatever whatever as well as how Capcom very pointedly leveraged that scarcity it's selling a solution to a problem it not only created but aggressively forced and it's hiding that fact behind layers of bullshit. It's a tactic Capcom is familiar with, the extra steps approach to obfuscating what exactly is being sold to the player. The publisher got away with an even more audacious form of this tactic with Resident Evil Something, that asymmetrical multiplayer game they shat out in 2020. Resident Evil Something had loot boxes that at first didn't appear monetized, and indeed there was no way to purchase them with anything but a purely in-game currency. Instead, what Capcom did with this all ready shitty game was sell booster consumables that allowed you to speed up the process of earning the money to buy the boxes. The result was a system in which Capcom was absolutely selling loot boxes via microtransactions and on top of that they thought you were all so fucking stupid that a few roundabout steps would trick you. I mean yeah it fooled some people but hey that's exactly what it was designed to do. Capcom, while a producer of excellent games, does think you're an asshole and does want to coerce, exploit, trick and pressure money out of you after you've already forked over $70. They're sort of like a video game publisher in that regard and people need to remember that when they so readily go to bat for a company that would laugh at them if they cared enough to take notice. Case. Close it. Playing Rise of Ronin at the same time as Dragon's Dogma 2 has been a whiplash of an experience when it comes to quality of life features and mechanics that actually respect a player's quality time. Not only is that game's world actually opened up rather than a web of deceptively restrictive paths, fast travel points are sensibly and liberally positioned around the map and, in a real shocker, you can travel to them anytime for free. You know, like in a normal game that isn't being a fucking cunt. On top of that, you get a horse, which controls really well, by the way, a glider. Oh, and the ability to flip from your glider directly onto the fucking horse in one motion. Oh, and you have a grappling hook. Oh, and your stamina doesn't drain out of combat so you can keep sprinting. Unlike the game that doesn't have accessible fast travel, a horse, a glider, a grappling hook, but does feature a top of the range seething fucking hatred for anybody playing it. All the many little ways in which Dragon's Dogma says fuck you to players are mirrored in the way Rise of Ronin says, hey, thanks for playing, come on in, we hope you have fun. Because screwing over a player is only really fun for the dicks doing the screwing. Rise of Ronin makes something as mundane as travel a diverse, speedy, downright enjoyable experience in its own right. 
Dragon's Dogma slows you down and gives you stamina penalties if you pick up one too many feathers. Rise of Ronin is more approachable and far less hostile to its players, and you know what else it is? It's harder than Dragon's Dogma. I say this not to suggest Rise of Ronin is just blatantly better than Dragon's Dogma, although it is, but because I want to highlight a rather prevalent fallacy that needs to be put down. The inaccurate conflation of inconvenience and challenge. See, it's inevitable that when you complain about a game being inaccessible, convoluted, and needlessly inconvenient, a bunch of gamers TM will arrive in a puff of smoke to explain how you just don't like challenging games, and want everything to be spoon-fed to you. I could do an entire fucking video on the way gamers misuse the term spoon-fed, but for now, no. Just... just no. Having your progress artificially and arbitrarily delayed by backtracking, manufactured scarcity, harsh encumbrance limits, or persistent stamina drain is not the same thing as overcoming a challenge, unless you're challenging your patience. There's nothing inherently difficult about walking on the same road a dozen times, fighting the same low-level goblins just to get to a town you've already explored at least half of those dozen times. I'm reminded of what the developer of Signalis said when their survival horror was criticised for a needlessly restricted of inventory that only allowed for six items to be carried at once. In addressing the complaints, they said that they were planning to resolve the situation and make it less of a hassle while still retaining the quote-unquote challenge. It's an inherently problematic thing to say because it enforces this wrong idea about what is and isn't a valid use of the player's finite time. I've played Signalis and let me tell you it can be fucking infuriating. And while there's plenty of challenge, the backtracking ain't it. At times it's a farcical process of running through the same handful of empty rooms to ferry items between a storage box and the objectives because you always need to carry more than you can carry. I can assure you as much as that sounds like a high octane thrill ride, it's not fucking hard. Simply restricting what a player can carry or where a player can go isn't challenging. It's being a hack if you don't bother to actually put some fucking challenge in it. And before anyone gives out, I am not saying the developer of Signalis is a hack, I actually quite like Signalis. Oh and if anyone thinks I'm calling the Dragon's Dogma dev a bunch of hacks, Saying you want to make a player backtrack to add challenge is like saying you want to fill a car full of snakes to make it fly. Although having said that, I do want to do that now. Everybody strap in! Rise of Ronin's challenge comes from its Sekiro by way of Neo combat and stealth against tough and fast enemies. The challenge doesn't come from non-existent lock-on features and 30 second stun locks. It doesn't come from draining your stamina out of combat when running is literally the fastest way you can get anywhere. It doesn't come from straight up refusing to tell you where you're supposed to go, or making you wait several in-game days to resolve a quest for fuck all reason. It certainly doesn't come from limiting what you can carry, to the point where your heroic adventurer has the strength of a baby. No, Rise of Ronin's challenge comes from things that are challenging, not from a video game acting the twat. Don't get me wrong, Ronin can also be fucking broken to smithereens with the right build and co-op turns bosses into a joke. So you can certainly make it very fucking easy. But the core gameplay is inherently designed to be both challenging and convenient. Because those two things are not at odds and I'm sick of how popular the contrary assumption is. Rise of Ronin review up on the Doomquisition.com soon. Now look, I'm being a bit spicy, uh, a bit naughty on purpose in some of this video, like just because, you know, you get inflammatory stuff and you be inflammatory and it's a whole circle of inflammatory fl flames, like that circle of fire Gangrel used to come out of in uh, t wrestling. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, before we go, uh, I just got to get this off of my exquisite chest. Um, Rise of Ronin has a better photo mode than Dragon's Dogma, which fixes the camera on a weird pivoting invisible arm, so you can't get a good shot. Rise of Ronin uh, lets you have the camera at any angle, you know, complete freedom. Again, uh, just another little difference in, in restrictiveness versus uh, convenience. Uh, and also, you can press a button to move the image frame by frame to get like the perfect shot, um, which I'd not seen in a, a photo mode in a game before. Um, it, it might have happened. Watch this, Lise. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. And now. As a game reviewer, um, I really appreciate that. Like photo modes are really good for me so I can get good screenshots, you know. Um, 
I'd be a really good photographer if I could take a picture. Thank God for me.